Father, I thank you for the privilege. It is a privilege, Lord God, to, to be allowed to participate in what you're doing. Lord, you don't need us. You don't need me, but you've invited me. You've invited us to participate in what you're doing in the earth. So I say, Lord, that today that I don't preach with the enticing words of man's wisdom, of human wisdom, but with demonstration and manifestation of the spirit and of power that you alone will receive all the glory and the praise and the honor. May we be enriched today by the reading, study, and reflection and meditation on the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are now in part eight of The Lord is My Shepherd. It's almost to a close. Next Sunday will be the final installment of the series, and I'm, I'm excited about what we've covered. And as usual, I want to begin today's sermon with some, I guess I'll say some stories to share. So uh, the stories I'd like to share actually uh, come close to home, and we're still on the subject of the Lord is my shepherd. So bear with me because these stories, I'll, I'll make the connection to the series uh, after I tell these stories. So uh, they're close to home because they represent people that I work with at Biola University. I'm a professor at Biola University. This is my eighth year there, and I have some stories. Amen. All right. We got some, we got some people excited about Biola. All right. And so I, I want to tell a few stories here. Uh, the first is, I'm gonna, her name is Deborah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you see her. She's a, she is a senior uh, student, and she is uh, majoring in psychology, okay? But the reason why I'm in, in, uh, referencing her is because she's a first-generation college student. She has a really interesting story. She was born in Harare, Zimbabwe, and her parents died when she was two, two years old. And at that point, her grandparents took her and her twin brother in. Uh, and when they took them in, they were seven. And then later, her aunt and uncle, her, her father's brother, uh, th her aunt and uncle discovered that they couldn't have children. And so they decided, hey, let's adopt um, our niece and nephew. And so they were adopted, and she came to the U.S. in 2004. Well, another interesting part about her story is that her brother had tuber tu tuberculosis, but it was a dormant strain. So nobody knew it until they got to the U.S. And he was almost, and he almost died from it. But the, but the miracle of it is that had it not been dormant, he wouldn't have allowed, been allowed to come to the U.S. And he wouldn't have been able to receive the medical treatment that would have saved his life. And it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful story. But even with all of that, uh, Deborah struggled with identity issues and all, and, and, and all these kinds of things with respect to just receiving God's love. And it's when she came to Biola, to, to, I'm gonna, I am going to toot a horn for my, for my institution here. She came to Biola and participated in our first-gen program, and she experienced the love of God in a way she had never experienced before, okay? And so first-gen first -gen student, and, but because of the support she received from this program, she was able to thrive, and she's graduating this year, and she'll be applying to grad schools. I believe she wants to go to Fuller, amongst other ones that she's considering, so I'm real, really excited for Deborah. So Deborah's our first one. Hey, let's give her a hand. Okay. I have another first-gen student, Freddie, born in Guatemala, right? His father is a pastor, and I, was talk I, talked, to all I talked to both of them last night, and the third one I'm going to mention to you. Uh, they waited 13 years to secure residency in the United States. He was telling me this story. They had to wait 13 years. And then, and then he said, after 13 years, they got an interview for the residency. But when you get the interview, it's still not guaranteed. So finally, they achieved residency. And he talked to me about the struggles being in the United States because he didn't speak English. He came to the United States relatively recently ago, right? And so we talked about not speaking English, and he basically had to learn English in high school, right? There were, there were hardly any other Spanish speakers, and it was just trial by fire. And when I listened to his story, I, I applaud him because you, you see me coming every week working through my Spanish, and he's, he's doing excellent learning his English. And so uh, he's actually inspiring me in terms of the language acquisition aspect of it. But he overcame all of that, and he, he got financial aid, and he too was part of the first-gen uh, experience, and he talked about, at Biola, he's also a Biola student, and he talked about how the support he received enabled him to 
thrive, the community there, and all those other kind of things, right? And so he is also graduating. He is also, he's in a three plus two program. That is, he's an engineering student where, student where he spends three years at Biola Engineering, and then he can transfer to another school like USC or some other school where he can finish his degree program and get a degree at Biola and a degree at that other school and also a master's degree. So he's doing incredible things. He's doing an internship this summer where he's actually applying his engineering skills and project management skills, and uh, he's going to just do wonderful in his life. So let's give a hand for Freddie. And last but certainly not least, we have Jermaine. Jermaine, I also talked to him last night, and I tell you, all three of their stories were amazing, and Jermaine is no, is no different. Uh, so he's been in foster care uh, numerous times. So at four years old, he was put into foster care. So he was in foster care from four to seven, and then his mother took him back, and then at nine, he was in foster care again. And then finally, he was adopted, and he was in his home for a long time, and uh, what happened was his adopted mother's child was killed, and what that did is exacerbate her stresses with alcoholism and what have you, and it resulted in him being kicked out of his house. And Jermaine was a... He was a model guy. I mean, like, he AP classes. He was in speech and debate. He was the class president. He was like, of all the kids you kick out, it wouldn't be that one. But yet he was kicked out of his house. Didn't know where to go. And he was just crying out to God. He was angry. Why me? Uh, but he's such an incredible young man, and he's very resourceful. All three of these young people are resourceful. And uh, he ended up coming to Biola, <laughs> going to our first-gen program where he found a community who would support him. And this young man is thriving. If you met him, you would think, you would not think any of the things that I would think. You would think that he was born in the most wonderful family who trained him well. In fact, if you saw him, he's a grown man, but you'd want to adopt him. I see him at Cone Campus. He's just working. He always has money in his pocket because he is getting it done. He's working. He's doing campus tours. He's doing all those kind of things. Jermaine is a fantastic guy, and he is also going to be graduating this year in communications. His future plans are, are to apply for an admissions job, but his long-term plans are to go to graduate school and eventually get his Ph.D. Let's give Jermaine a hand. So why did I mention these stories, these students, their histories? What does it have to do with our series? Well, here's the thing. They're all first-generation students, first-generation college students. And what's significant about being first-generation is that you're the first in your family to go to college. And that's something to celebrate, certainly. But the, the, the things that first-generation students deal with is they don't have the family members that can give them the inside information about how to navigate an institution like a university, okay? And they deal with so many different things. They deal with psychological challenges. For example, guilt because they're leaving their families and they have opportunities that their families don't have. Shame because they don't have confidence in themselves. They're thinking everybody else is smart, but they're not smart, right? Confusion with respect to the lack of guidance right? Anxiety. Uh, they have academic, academic cha challenges. Sometimes they're simply not prepared, right? Because they, uh, perhaps their parents or their family members weren't preparing them, and they, they, they go to college, and they don't realize some of the extra things you have to do to succeed. Uh, they have financial issues. Many of them are also uh, uh, students of color as well, so they deal with some of these dynamics going on with respect to identity and, and fitting in and all those other kind of things. And so what is important when you have first-gen students is for universities like Biola, they have programs that supplement these things so that they can navigate the world and succeed as these three are. Now, I bring this up because as I was thinking about their experience, and as I was thinking about what we're talking about with respect to people going deeper in the word, I see a parallel. Because just as there are first-generation college students, there are first-generation believers. First-generation believers. You're a Christian, but there's no one in your uh, family background or even your spiritual uh, family background who will model what it means to be serious about God. You just think being serious about God is coming to church or viewing the YouTube channel, right? And that's church, and we're doing well that way. But what we were talking about last week, just as when you are in college and you can't just go to class, you can't just go to class. You've got to do other things like 
study groups and tutoring and office hours and all those other kind of things, which may not be obvious to you if you have not come from a tradition where that's normal. Similarly, with people who are first-gen Christians and many, might I say millennials, right, who have found their own way with Christianity. You have your own way of church. You have your own way of thinking about things. However, you're detached from a tradition of going deep with God. Why? Because you have so many options. It, it appears that you can access knowledge in other kinds of ways. You have, you have the internet, you have Google, you have social media. You, you, can, you can figure out things on your own. You don't need to be in church all day, all week. You don't need to do all those other kind of things because you determine that it really is not profitable to you. But what's happened is you've been detached from individuals who really know how to get a prayer through. You've been detached from individuals and I have an image now of my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, and, and she would sit there reading her Bible. And I would just see her, and, you know, she'd be sitting there, this big old thick black Bible, and she'd just be sitting there content, turning the pages, reading the Word of God. Going deeper in the Scripture. And this woman, she's lived a long life. She, you can imagine she knows a lot already, and yet... In her 80s and 90s, and she lived to be 100, she was going deeper in the Word of God. You need to see and be around people who go deep in God. And so because of that, because of some people, maybe not all of you, some of you being first-generation Christians, that it may not be obvious to you that when the shepherd is leading you, there's things you've got to do too. He's not going to lead you in spite of yourself. You've got to draw close to God. And then he will then draw close to you. Now, last week we discussed a category of person that fits this description that I'm talking about. They are described in Jesus' parable of the sower. We've discussed this parable for much of the series because the parable of the sower is really about how God shepherds us. We've talked about the fact that a shepherd's job is to lead and feed. God does both with his word. A shepherd's job is to lead and feed God does both with his word. And some of you may say, what about the Holy Spirit? We're going to get to that, not this series. Okay, we're just focusing on the scriptural aspect of it. There's other ways that God leads us for sure, but the word is the anchor. Because if you can, if you can, if you can listen to the, if, you, if you're familiar with the word, you will recognize his voice when he speaks to you. If you're not in the Word, you don't know who's talking to you when you hear something in your head or your heart. You can measure it against the Scripture, and you can recognize, oh, that's my daddy talking to me. I know who that is. I know who that is. That's the Father talking to me. And in this age, in this time, there's so many voices in our heads, but we have to ground ourselves in what our Father God has communicated to us in writing which is to some degree why I'm talking about this academic aspect of it. Because look, for this, char this, this, this charge I've given you to go deep in the Word, for some of you to do that, it means you have to be more studious than you were in school. You, didn't, you weren't that consistent in school, some people. And so now to read the Word every day, you've never done anything like that every day. You've gotta, some people don't like to read. They can read, they just don't like to do it. Especially today. You just want to let me watch it. Let, let the book better be short. <laughs> let me tell you something. Get over it. Get over it. There, there's some things he's hidden in there for you. Let me tell you something. As you get older, you may not like to eat vegetables. Uh, you may not like to exercise. You, you, may like to do, you may not like to do a lot of stuff, but as you get older, you got to get over it. <laughs> you got to change your diet. <laughs> you got to change what you do. If you want to live and be, and be lively, you, you may not have ever liked to drink water. You better drink it now. And it's the same with respect to the, sh the shepherd has insight. He wants to give us. So we got to get over our hangups and go get where he's talking and go to where he's talking. 
The parable of the sower presents the shepherd to us as a farmer scattering seed on four different kinds of soil. The seed represents the word. The soil represents four different heart postures, which all represent what we call four different kinds of listeners. So as we talked about for the last few weeks, the first soil was the wayside soil. We call that the level one listener, the wayside soil, and that's the soil where it was sown, but as soon as it was sown, the, the Jesus parable says the birds came and snatched up the seeds, and that's analogous to Satan coming immediately to steal the word from people who don't understand, and they don't understand because God won't let them understand, and God won't let them understand because they don't want to understand. God holds the key. Now, let me clarify something. I, so I'm not a Calvinist. That means I don't, I, I don't interpret pre, I don't want to get into all that, but I don't interpret predestination the way they do. Uh, and, and it's fine because I have deep respect for people who are in that camp theologically. Uh, but what I am saying, though, is that God controls this stuff. You're not going to just walk up and grab the word. He's got to give it to you. And he's going to give it to you when you're humble enough to know he knows and you don't. Okay, so that's wayside soil. Then the stony soil, level two, which we're going to spend some time on, is the level in which it was sown on soil. It had a lot of rocks in it, and so therefore there was no depth that could be established, right? There was no root system because the stones were there. And so they endured for a little bit, and then they petered out because when the trials of life came, the root, there was no root system to reinforce the plant. That's stony level two. Thorny soil is level three, and that's the soil that has the weeds, which represent the cares of life. The, so, the, the word is sown, but you have so many other things in your ear that it drowns out what God is trying to tell us, which is why we've been talking about scriptural meditation, rehearsing the word in our hearts, in our ears, in our mouths, day and night, so that, that, is, the, that is just a perpetual, so that God's thoughts are perpetually playing in our minds. And then finally, level four is the good soil. That's the level four listener. These are people who have the Psalm 119 attitude. If you haven't read Psalms 119 from cover to cover, do that because it gives you the attitude of somebody who was good soil for the Word of God. Okay, so let's get back to this level two listener, stone and soil. I'm going to read the part that in, in, in Jesus' parable uh, where he explains and interprets what the stony soil is. So that's Matthew 13, 20 through 21. It says this. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So what you see here are four different things going on. The first is the immediate and joyful reception of the word of God the joy of hearing the sermon, the word, the teaching. And then there's a period of endurance, temporary endurance. They're, you know, going for a while. And we talked last week. It's kind of like when you sign up for a class. First, you know, first few weeks, everyone has an A. There's been no assignments turned in. There's no been, been no test. Everybody's doing great. Right? And then what happens? There's tribulation or persecution, but in the academic context, it's your midterm. Midterm happens. Right? And you see what your grade is, a D. And the last thing is immediately falling away. You drop the class. You're done. You're done. Now, I remember having a similar experience. I've shared a version of this story before when I was an undergrad in college. My major was American literature and culture. And because of that, I didn't need to take math as an as a elective. But I wanted to because I just remembered all the... It seems like all the smart kids were taking calculus in high school. And I said, I could do that. I can do that. Let me just challenge myself. I could have just taken astronomy and called it a day. But I decided to take calculus. And, you know, I got there, and it was rough. I did great in my pre-calc and leading up to it and all that kind of stuff. And this calculus class was, was tough. And I was riding a C, a C, a big fat C. And the teacher was difficult to understand. And, so, and, and I could have I quit because I didn't need the class. But I said, let me just, I'm going to go to tutoring. So I went to my tutor, and I've shared this before, and she was just breaking it down. And she, 
you know, and just she showed me a one, two, three method to solving the problem. And I said, well, why didn't he say that? She said, well, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Just do this. <laughs> you know how it is? Some professors can't teach very well. They're, they're smart. They have a PhD. And he just went over my head. Now, I ended up with a B in that class. And let me tell you, I had to work for that B. I had to work for that B. But because I developed a root system, I said, let's, let's, let's go at this again. I, we, we can get this, Joshua. Joshua, we can get this. We can do this. Let's, let's, let's go, right? And so this is what happens sometimes with people. They have, they're excited on the front end, they, 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 and, then, and then they, and they peter out. They peter out. Great start, terrible finish. What's worse is that people turn this into a lifestyle. They get excited about the sermon on Sunday, but with nothing to show for it during the week. And this is one reason why millennials leave the church. You know why? Because they've watched the adults in front of them go to church, get excited, and there's no transformation in their lives or the society. And so they're like, it's not working for you. Okay? What they do not realize when people do this, what they do not realize is that they are missing the shepherd's leadership. They don't know that they are missing the shepherd's leadership because in their minds, they're attending church every week. So I'm clearly hearing from God. I'm going to the sermon. I'm getting the sermon. I'm taking notes. I'm doing all this kind of stuff, right? So like in your minds, so it's like I'm doing this. But that's the deceiving part. Growing in faith actually requires more than that. The emotion of the church experience, especially when the sermon is good, and I'm not talking about a sermon you don't understand. I'm talking about a sermon you do understand. The emotion of that can be seductive. A good church service will make you feel like you're moving forward just because you're there. The collective faith, spirit, and energy of the group lifts you up, not to mention all the music and production values that are designed to make you feel better than you would otherwise. Customer service, people helping you out, like all these good feelings, right? This is not to brush off church as something superficial. Certainly there is value in the spiritual renewal that comes from the experience of an uplifting experience with other followers of Jesus. The real issue is this, when the emotion is absent, are you still committed? Or really, were you ever committed? Monday exposes us all. Now, let me be clear. We're not against emotion, right? We're not against emotion. Emotion is good for what it is and does. Not only does emotion add meaning to life, but when we process our emotions in a healthy way, they give us helpful information about our personal growth and development, which is why people should go to therapy, right? It helps you process your emotions. You get information about what's going on in the inside. You can make healthy choices about what you're doing. That's all fantastic. Emotions aren't bad. They're just inconsistent. You don't know how you're going to feel on Monday. But if you're committed, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you're depending on positive emotions to support, I mean, I like it when it's there. But some mornings I do not want to get up and pray. Some mornings I have a busy day. And I'm like, ah, I could just squeeze. I don't have to get into the Word. I mean, I'm not talking about getting legalistic about this, but I'm just talking about patterns of life. Like, you can, you can just, you know, maybe not do it today because you're busy. You got things to do. God understands. And sometimes the emotion, and sometimes it's a struggle to get up and read. My mind is just going all these other places. But I, I, my mind may not be focused, but I'm still putting my eyes on this page, and I'm going to get this Word in me. I may not even fully understand what I'm reading right now, but I want to maintain the practice of getting before God's Word. The practice of getting before God's Word because that is where He's leading me.
This is where the rubber meets the road. When you leave class, when you leave church, you're on your own. And that's the startling reality of first-gen students. They're in the class with everybody else. But without a program like we have at Biola and many other schools have to give them support, they will leave and not go deep. This is what distinguishes the first-gen student from the second, third, or fourth-gen student. This is what distinguishes the person who just has knowledge on the surface level versus someone who has the subject matter at a deep enough level to be prepared for the exam and to graduate and to be successful, which these, all three of these students have done, and many other students like them. You should go to our webpage and check out their stories, by the way. Uh, yes, so here's the deal. God leads and feeds us through a spiritual root system. The deeper we are in the Word, the deeper our root system. Word depth is not developed while we are listening to the sermon on Sunday, but while we are meditating on it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday and back again. And here's the thing. We... We have no excuse. There is so much material out there for free. For free. I mean, you used to have to buy people's sermons. It's, it's all, you, it, you just have access. They got study guides and apps. You have no excuse not to get in the Word of God for yourself. And what does that scriptural meditation look like? We've talked about it. Reading talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night, reading, talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night. God leads us as we meditate on the Word. Now, I do actually need to teach a sermon on the, the specifics of scriptural meditation, but that's down the road. But for now, you certainly know it means that we are uh, meditating on the Scripture, itself, the Bible, okay? But it can also mean meditating on trusted and spiritually gifted people who expound on the Scripture as well and books and things of that nature that can supplement it as well, right? Listening to teaching. And so I've, I've tried to, I am making a better effort myself to sit down and listen to things because I have a 500, uh, you know, YouTube playlist of preachers and teachers and things that, oh, that'll be good, that'll be good, but when do I sit down and read it and listen to it and take notes? And so I've got to do that. As I said before, if I don't do that, then I'm just prepping for the sermon, and I'm not getting fed myself. It's deceptive. That's why some preachers fall, by the way. They're gifted. They're talented. They know the Word. They can slice it and dice it, but they're not being fed themselves by Jesus. And I have no advantages. I don't have any more advantages. I'm a preacher, but I don't have more advantages I gotta, when I go home, I got to do everything. I have the same challenges you have, wanting to get up and all those other constraints, trying to fit into my schedule. It's the same for preachers as it is for people who aren't preachers. There is something true uh, that is both true about academic students and spiritual students. Because, they, because really a disciple just means student. So when we say we're disciples of Christ, we're saying that we are students of Jesus and his teachings. Here's the kicker here. Successful students get inside information. Successful students get inside information. And again, this is, this is the, to me, this is the biggest first-gen issue, right? Because first of all, when you, so I'll just use my parents. I mean, my parents, so I'm a, I guess a second-generation college student. I'm a second-generation, plus I have rel other relatives in my family who've, not just gone to college, but went to the same school. Well, went to UCLA. A lot of us went to UCLA. And I would listen to my parents talk about going to college and the experiences they had and what they did, how they navigated classes. They would take me to UCLA. They, they, you know, they would you know, come and visit. And so it was just, you know, in a situation like that, you don't ever decide to go to college. You, you're just going. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it's not a decision to go to college. You're going. And you never think about it because people always say, it's just normal. 
And so when I run into problems at UCLA, I just figure it out. I go to the, talk to the professor. You know, one time I couldn't get into a class because, you know, you know they have registration and the, they, they cap it off. I said, I'm not worried about that. I'm going to go to the class anyway. I'm going to go to the class anyway. So I sat, I was in the class several weeks, maybe like three or four or five, and I'm talking to the professor, and I'm asking about something, and he was like, oh, yeah, fine, just load this up over here. And he said, no, I'm not, I'm not registered in the class. I can't do it. He says, you're not registered in the class? You're doing more work than the students who are registered. I'm going to fix that right now. You've you got to know the curriculum behind the curriculum. You've got to know, okay, so how does this, I know what the teacher said in the curriculum. They're required to say that on the syllabus. I know that. But how do they really grade? What do you really have to do to get an A in here? And you figure that stuff out. Being, doing well in college is not about being smart, it's about being resourceful. You can be the, you might not even be the most brightest person in the class, but you're resourceful. And that's what these first gen students are learning at Biola. So here's how it relates. Spiritual growth requires inside information not just the information communicated to the general audience. Inside information is hidden from people who don't want it and hidden for people who do. Inside information is hidden from people who don't want it and hidden for people who do. This is why, when the disciples went to him, this is why he spoke in parables. Because he, Jesus, like many teachers, is speaking to a mixed audience. Everybody's not at the same level of desire for truth. So I'm going to put it out there, and the ones who are serious will see me at office hours which is what the disciples did. They talked to him after he gave the parable. They said, Jesus, what does this mean? They were going what? To office hours. They wanted what? Inside information. Matthew 13, 10 through 11. Verse 10, it says, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, Look, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. Why? They don't want it. The soil in their hearts, whether they level one, level two, or level three, rejects the Word of God. So I put the parable out there, and the serious ones are going to come see me like you. The interpretation of the, of the parable was not given to the crowds. It was given to the disciples. Which means that just because the preacher's preaching doesn't mean you're getting the secrets. Even if there's a bunch of teachable moments in it, like, ooh, that was good, or ooh, that, you, you, you're grabbing things. But if, listen, you're not going to remember what I'm saying right now in two months. You're not going to remember it. If all you're doing is coming and say, ooh, that was good, that was, that, oh, that was good, yeah, that was good, sir, that, that was good. And that's all, I mean, I'm flattered, but I'm not excited. Because I'm like a businessman. You can have a lot of activity, but did we make a profit, though? Did we make money? Then I'm not happy. You can have a lot of activity in church, but if you're not growing, I'm not happy. I'm going to jump down to this last passage here. Go to Jeremiah 3, 14 through 15. This is toward the end of my notes if you're looking at the digital notes. Jeremiah 3, 14 through 15 says this. It's a really interesting statement. In fact, before you read that, let me say these two statements. Uh, um, these, are, these are in your digital note, just above the passage, and where it says the you factor there. Okay. As you draw near to God, the quality of his instruction increases. It, 
it's not, I mean, it's not because he becomes a better teacher because he's the best he can ever be right now. But it's just that what you experience of his teaching, that quality increases. Your commitment to God affects the kind of pastors who are in your life and what they teach. If you're not being taught well, it's because you're not leaning in. He gives you the pastors and leaders you deserve. We get the pastors and leaders we deserve. Let me tell you, let me, let, Jeremiah breaks it down. This is an Old Testament context. He is talking in context here, but I, I think there's a principle here as we look at it, right? Because he's, uh, you know, Jeremiah is, you know, talk, lamenting about the behavior of Israel and how they've been idolatrous and, and, and all those other kind of things. But then he's saying, look, you can return to God. With all your craziness, you can still return to God. And so he says in verse 14, he says, return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you from one from a, I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And 15 is the kicker. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. We always blame the preachers who fall. But we like the preachers who fall. We like, let's, we, that, we like that. If we wanted something deeper, we would draw close to God and he would give us pastors who would tell us the truth. But because we really don't want to change and we just want the emotional high of a Sunday service, then, you know, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take a pastor that has all the charisma but doesn't have the longevity and the integrity. And then we complain when they fall. But when I look at this, it's like, are we serious about seeking God? This doesn't just apply to pastors. It applies. A shepherd is a metaphor for leadership. It applies to political leaders. The leaders we have are the leaders we deserve. And when you want leaders who follow God, then you follow God. You draw close to God. The human person you call pastor is not the source of the words communicated to you. God is. This is what's funny. You affect what I teach. You know, and you probably think, and this is how I thought for the longest time, you know, I just go to my study, I pray, and, you know, God talks to me, I give you the word, and, you know, I have this fixed quantity of knowledge that I give to you. And I'm not saying that that's not going on, but what I'm telling you is God is in control of it. We saw this several weeks ago when we talked about Cornelius in the book of Acts, and because of Cornelius' commitment to God, God changed Peter's heart so that he can give Cornelius what Cornelius needed. God will stop me mid-sentence if you start seeking the Lord to tell you what you need to hear. As you dig deep in the Word and in prayer, He will get to you. Now, this won't be the only way. He can certainly anointed, God anoints teachers to communicate the Word of God. He can also talk to you directly and in prophecy. and all. There's other ways that He communicates, certainly. But what I'm telling you, if you don't feel the teaching is, is really getting what you need, you got to go deeper with God, and He'll change what I'm saying. He'll kick me out. He will put a new pastor here just to respond to you. He's more committed to the hearts of people who are committed to Him than He is to a charismatic preacher. He can get another one. He can make the rocks cry out. He can make a donkey preach. He don't need me. He uses me, but he doesn't need me. There are some things he won't even tell me until you're ready to hear it. So here's the question. Do we want to remain shallow or do we want to go deep? When we all go deep together as a church, in our own time, God will say more to us. He will say more to us. Stuff that's going to blow our minds. Because it's coming from him. He's the teacher. I'm not the teacher. He's the teacher. I'm just the assistant coach. He's the head coach. 
I work for the assistant coach. I'm the under shepherd. He's the great, he's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. He's the one leading us. I'll leave you with this. You're not ready for more insight until you're ready for more insight. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your leadership, your guidance, your um, just the grace to know you and your truth. And Lord, we're eager, we're excited to just learn more about you. We want to draw close to you. Um, there may be people here this morning on site or online, and you need to draw close to God. But for you, your first destination is an encounter with Jesus Christ. There's a lot of ideas out there about what it means to be godly, what it means to be spiritual, but I can tell you what the Bible says, that if you want to draw near to God, you've got to draw near to Jesus. Jesus is God, but he's not just God. He was a human being who lived on this earth, and he endured the punishment that was supposed to be a sign to us. As good as many of us think we are sometimes, it is far below God's standard for righteousness. And our, our inevitable judgment was to be punished in a way that was comparable to the way Jesus was punished. But he took the punishment for us, So he took our pain, he took our, our guilt, he took our shame on the cross, and he buried it. But because Jesus was actually a righteous man, he could not remain dead. He could not remain in that state. God resurrected him. And when he was resurrected, he came in holiness and righteousness. And now, because he took our sin, we can accept his righteousness as our own. It's a miracle. It's, an, it, it's a miracle. It's the grace of God that makes it possible. That is the gospel, that God's grace makes it possible to live a righteous life. It's only possible by his grace. And so it is by faith in Christ that we receive that grace. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know what your past is, what your life is right now. But the power of his resurrection is such that it doesn't matter what your life is right now. If right now you commit to him, you can live a righteous life. And if that's what you want, I want you to repeat something after me. And let me tell you, these words you will repeat, they're just words. But if in your heart you are turning away from the life you live now and turning toward a life with Jesus, then those words will have meaning. So if that's you, I want you, I want you to repeat after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and that I need your salvation. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he shed his blood, that he was buried, that he was resurrected, and that in resurrection, he gave me the power to live a righteous life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can live a holy life. I submit to Jesus as my Lord, my Master, and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe the first time and meant it, um, I want you to text Zoe Save to the number on your screen. This is a really important step. This may sound routine. I say it every week, but this is our way of connecting with you, and we want to see you grow. We've been talking about the parable of the sower, and if you let the enemy come and steal the, the word that just got into your heart, he'll do it that quick, okay? Send that text so that we can be in communication with you, pray with you, and just 
we're all in this journey together. None of us are perfect. We want to walk with you. So send that text. The other thing I want to say is that for some of you, when you accepted the Lord as your Savior, you may have experienced, uh, you begin to be speaking in a supernatural language that you don't understand. That happens sometimes when people come to faith. Uh, it, it, it's, nothing, it's nothing strange. It's in the Bible. It's a supernatural language. It has various applications, but it's a, it's a way in which uh, God supernaturally communicates to his people, through his people, and it's a form of prayer as well, okay? So just embrace that. We're going to be talking about that in the, in, the, in the months to come, about what that is and the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and all those kind of things, but embrace that. And for those of you who have a desire to draw close to things like that, um, just keep praying for God to, for the Holy Spirit to give you everything that he has for you. And at some point, we're going to be talking about it more explicitly, but keep your heart open to the gifts of the Spirit. Finally, uh, for those of you who are looking to join this church, uh, you, you, you can't be a Christian by yourself. I mean, you can, but not effectively. Um, we want to embrace you in our church family if it's such that you're looking for a church home. And if that's the case, all you need to do is text Zoe member to the number on your screen, and that will give you more information about what we're about and also how to connect with us and how to become a member if that is your desire, or simply if you just want to be more connected with our church. Amen?